Massacres, torture and kidnappings. The list of alleged war crimes committed by Russia is growing. Moscow's military is relentlessly bombarding civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. Power is often out. People are freezing in their homes and shelters. Hospitals are destroyed. Doctors are working to exhaustion. War crimes or just the regrettable side effects of any war. Meanwhile, artillery barrages continue with undiminished force in the eastern Donbas province. Today, we ask, has Russia become a terrorist state? Hello and welcome to To The Point. Let me introduce today's panel. Jessica Berlin is a political analyst and a visiting fellow of the German Marshall Fund, a think tank. Wolfgang Richter, former paratrooper and retired colonel with Germany's Bundeswehr, now a military analyst at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And our very own Natalia Smolenceva from DW's Russia Desk. A warm welcome to all of you. And I would like to uh, start a look at the situation on the ground. Kherson was uh, just retaken by Ukraine. There was jubilation about it, but now morale apparently is very low. Citizens fearing, are fearing the winter because Russia has destroyed a lot of infrastructure when retreating. Now, Ukraine calls that a terrorist act and a war crime. Wolfgang, is that true? Uh, what I think is one should not uh, call Russia as a whole, as a terrorist state. There are, of course, violations of uh, human rights. There are violations of uh, the humanitarian law of war. Uh, and the aggression as such is, of course, a crime against uh, the peace. On the other hand, uh, Russia as a state is not a terrorist state, but we have still to uh, look at the future. And we should still be in a position to talk to uh, the Russian leadership, whoever that might be, because we need it. We need a strategic dialogue, the Americans need it for the strategic balance, and we might need it in Europe to avoid a, a worst uh, scenario. But if we're looking at what, what happens uh, on, on the ground there right now, the Ukrainian authorities understandably say, uh, that worry that the population is facing a second battle now against the cold uh, uh, and against hunger. So, uh, well, Natalia, let me ask you as well, is that a war crime? Is that the act, the other, those the actions of a terrorist? Well, I've been just talking to people who are in Ukraine right now, to our correspondents, and both people I know there, maybe not specifically in Kherson, but all around Ukraine, there is a major blackout. I think yesterday was a very important day, so to say, because of the um, of the massive attacks on the infrastructure, and this is a deliberate strategy to um, targeting this infrastructure. Um, the shelling, the bombs are not aiming at the military objects, they're aiming at the uh, power stations to make conditions for civil violence actually unbearable and Ukrainian authorities have, have said it numerous times that uh, this is act of terror, this is a deliberate strategy and I think Zelensky has been asking for months um, his European and American partners to actually list Russia as a terrorist state. They're only doing this now and I think the reason is that they want to ensure uh, the support, it's largely a symbolic state, a symbolic move to actually show, show Ukrainians, show Ukrainian uh, politicians that we are with you, we know what's happening and we stand by your side. But whether this will have any actual effect both on the battlefield and also um, can it change uh, something in Kremlin? I don't think so. Well, we come to, to the, the designation as a terrorist state um, uh, in a moment. Uh, let me talk about the, the Pope recently. He reminded the world of Holomodor. That's the 1930s attempt by Stalin to starve uh, millions of Ukrainians into, into submission. Seven million people died. Jessica, do you see parallels here? Is Putin taking a leaf uh, out of Stalin's book there? Um, is, is that using hunger as a weapon? Absolutely. We have to remember that Russian aggression in Ukraine and the efforts of the Russian state to destroy Ukrainian national and cultural identity and to eradicate the Ukrainian population predates this war by a long, long time. This is centuries of recurring violence from the Russian Empire in the Tsarist times, from the Soviet Union under Stalin. So for Ukrainians, this war, this war of aggression, is just a further step in a centuries-long history of Russian attempts to annihilate Ukrainian cultural and national identity. 
And the 90th anniversary of the Holodomor genocide is, of course, a, a stirring and stark reminder of what happens when we, as the international community, fail to act, fail to uh, to deter and detain Russian aggression. Now, uh, Kiev's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, says the coming winter uh, will be the worst since World War II for Ukrainians. Um, is that true? If I may quickly come to the food as a weapon in the war, I think we can also see it is more broadly, like the grain deal, for instance, the attempt of blocking Ukrainian grain coming out of ports, which will cause not only hunger in Ukraine, but also for the African countries, for the other countries in the world. I think... Um, Russia and Putin using food as a weapon has been a topic for a long time. It's not only now. Now maybe it's become more actual because of the, uh, you know, anniversary of Holodomor and these kind of things. But I think it's like a recurring uh, topic and it's not <coughs> like uh, this one um, event. And as for the coming winter, of course, um, the situation right now on the ground is very dire. Uh, but from what I hear, people are, it's not like they're used to it, but they've been there prepared to endure it for some time yet. And I've been trying to figure out if there'll be, you know, there are moods of, uh, you know, moving maybe to other European countries or to, you know, Eastern parts of Ukraine. And I haven't found those. People are determined to stay there. People are determined to fight. People are not prepared to negotiate at this point. And I think this, um, you know, referring to what's happening now as the worst winter since Second World War, it's also kind of an urge from um, Vitaly Klitschko, in this case, from Ukrainian politicians to attract more attention to what's happening and to actually call um, European partners to deliver what they promised, because they've promised uh, a lot of help. Here in Berlin, we had this um, conference and reconstruction of U on Ukraine, and like an enormous amount of money was promised there. But there was also a message from uh, President Zelensky saying that we haven't seen a cent of this money, mm. and it's very great that you are promising this and you want to restore the Ukraine after the war, but we need this money and this assistance right now. And sadly, from what I'm hearing from our correspondent there is that, uh, you know, this support is being delayed. Now, you said that what you're hearing from, from the correspondents is also that the morale is still high. People are willing to endure even the hunger uh, and the cold. Um, now, after nearly a year of fighting, uh, many serious incidents have uh, come to light and are being investigated right now. Let's have a, a closer look at the allegations. A list of atrocities that keeps growing. UN investigators say there is mounting evidence of Russian horrors in Ukraine, including torture, sexual violence, executions and mass graves in places like Bucha, now a crime scene. Reports by Amnesty International indicate that Moscow has also abducted Ukrainian civilians, even separating children from their parents only to give them up for adoption in Russia. Many also consider Russia's bombing of critical infrastructure in Ukraine to be a targeted attack on the civilian population, which constitutes a war crime. People are currently at risk of freezing to death. In light of these serious accusations, calls are growing louder to classify Russia as a terrorist state. That's exactly what the European Parliament did this week and voted overwhelmingly in favour of such a resolution. But the US is not willing to go that far. President Biden believes that this classification could set back humanitarian efforts in Ukraine and jeopardise potential peace negotiations with Russia. Now, what constitutes a terrorist state? Uh, one definition of terrorism is the systematic use of violence to create a general climate of fear in a population and thereby to bring about a particular political objective. Uh, Wolfgang, does Russia fit the bill here? Sounds like it. Uh, normally, uh, the EU and other countries in the West would uh, qualify a terrorist state as a state that sponsors terrorist organizations. That is at least a classical a definition of that. Uh, take the case of Iran and the case of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. It was um, defined as a terrorist organization and Iran is supporting it. When we now uh, want to um, define a complete state as a terrorist organization or as a terrorist state, then uh, it, uh, by, I, I guess Biden is, is correct in saying this might go too far because we still have a need to discuss with that state. It's not about 
single persons. That is a difference. And we, of course, will have to find out finally who, has, uh, who is responsible for the violations of human rights or for uh, uh, humanita of humanitarian law. Uh, but that goes too far because we still, uh, if we, if we uh, demonize a complete state, we will have difficulty to negotiate later and we need it and the US needs it. The US needs to have to keep the uh, nuclear balance. Of course, they want to have a successor treaty of the New START treaty and they will uh, restart the uh, strategic dialogue. So I find uh, that is a, a, maybe a moral impetus behind that that can uh, maybe satisfy their own needs, but for practical purposes, I think it's not very realistic and we will have to speak again. Um, if Jessica, I may jump yes, in there, um, a couple of points to, to break down from Wolfgang's comments. Firstly, yes, he's right that typically the state sponsor of terror is referring to a state that's sponsoring other terrorist groups, not necessarily a state undertaking their own terrorist actions. In this case, however, Russia fits both bills. This is not the first time that Russia has been up for consideration as a state sponsor of terror. They have already been known to sponsor the Iranian IRGC group. For example, they have sponsored and supported Hezbollah and even given them direct military and financial support in Syria. So Russia as a state sponsor of foreign terror is already on the cards. And now, with the war of aggression in Ukraine and the terrible war crimes they have committed, and as per your definition that you mentioned earlier, they have clearly been committing directly acts of terror to terrorize the Ukrainian population. Now, the practical considerations that Wolfgang refers to from the American calculus is important to consider, because by labeling Russia a state sponsor of terror, the sanctions would be extended not only to Russia, but also to any other companies around the world doing business with Russian entities. And this could get very complicated very fast, thus the, the American hesitation. However, I disagree with the concern that labeling Russia a state sponsor of terror would somehow mean that we are no longer able to speak with Russia. On the contrary, this would be a very strong signal of deterrence and an incentive for the Russians to back down and come peacefully to the negotiating table by saying, you will not get off this list until you lay down your arms and leave Ukrainian territory. Would you agree? I, no, I don't agree. I think we will not be in a position to blackmail Russia into a submission. Uh, this is uh, unrealistic in my view. Uh, and if you uh, uh, demonize uh, a complete state, I don't speak about single persons who are responsible for this and that, uh, then you will have difficulty later on to speak openly to that state and it will not be uh, just a negotiation where the one side uh, 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 decides what, what uh, sorry, where one side decides uh, on which terms they have done to settle finally. It, it has to be a negotiations on equal footing. So uh, there's no other way out. Otherwise you can not get strategic balance and that is, a, is an American interest. What do you mean by demonization? Uh, the, this country is committing genocide. Uh, w what is being demonized precisely? Uh, this country is not committing genocide. I think we should not be easy, uh, we should not easily apply this word genocide. There are certain terms for genocide. You can say, and I would agree on that, they are committing war crimes, yes. They are committing maybe crimes against uh, uh, humanity. There is a crime of aggression, of course, as such. Uh, which is all, uh, they are all crimes defined in the statute of the International Court of uh, uh, Justice. But uh, you cannot say it's a genocide in the sense of the international definition. If, I think that's also not me, the Wolfgang, term. Forgive me, Wolfgang, but I just will push back this one last time because the definition of genocide is acts committed in whole or in part against a people to yeah. destroy their national and their cultural identity. And this has indeed taken place in Ukraine. Um, having lived and worked previously in Rwanda, uh, my familiarity with genocide statutes um, is perhaps not as a lawyer, um, but certainly uh, deep enough to, to know that the Russian crimes in Ukraine do in fact qualify by law as genocide. Mm. Let me now let me uh, um, uh, address one question uh, to Natalia. Uh, the reaction in what would the reaction in, in Russia be? Would, would the Kremlin care at all? Well, I think I was precisely wanted to say that, that, you know, I think by, by now, Kremlin has, is not caring, actually, what mm -hmm. has been called and how it's been called, especially this, um, you know, European Union, European Commission uh, label of uh, 
um, terrorism state or st state supporting terrorism, it doesn't mean anything in practical terms for Kremlin. It's uh, they condemn their actions uh, in Ukraine, but this is no news uh, for neither for Putin or for Peskov. Um, like Maria Zaharov, for instance, has reacted to this in, in you know, a typical Kremlin way of, you know, laughing in their face about saying, yeah, and this European Union is a state uh, supporting stupidity or something like that. So it shows us the, the level of communication. There is no, you know, no this diplomatic um, talking about uh, this. Uh, whether I think if the United States, as uh, as you mentioned, it's a, very, it's a very different thing if United States, States would list Russia as a terrorist state because it has some legal implications. And I think that would be taken very seriously. Um, in Kremlin in practical terms, but I don't think it will force them to either come to the table of negotiation or not come. I think uh, what can actually move Russia to go to a negotiation is the situation in the battlefield. And as long as um, both Russia or actually both sides have something to achieve in the battlefield, there is no need for them to go mm. to the negotiation table, sadly. That's the, uh, the ne our next topic that I would like uh, to come to, uh, because the tactical picture on the ground is changing for both parties. With winter coming, many expect that dropping temperatures will subdue the fighting. Despite icy temperatures, fighting in Ukraine continues undiminished. A contentious battle is taking place in Bakhmut, located within the Donbass region. The small town remains under Ukrainian control. According to Ukrainian sources, Russia is sending inexperienced recruits to fight there. The small town has little strategic value at the moment, but after abandoning Kherson, the Russian army seems willing to risk anything to achieve even the slightest victory. However, experts suspect that the freezing temperatures could soon slow down the pace of fighting, and Russia in particular would currently benefit from a break. That would allow time to rebuild their armed forces. But that is precisely what the Ukrainian army wants to avoid. They're keeping up the pressure, but Ukrainian President Zelensky admits that the cost in human lives and resources is enormous. Which side? Now, which side is profiting more from uh, the current situation and uh, the, w the winter and the cold temperatures that are coming? Uh, can you think, can Ukraine keep up the momentum on the, on the battlefield that they have at the moment and, and push Russia further? The Ukraine has uh, achieved a lot during the last months. Uh, the first big uh, defeat they had uh, dealt to uh, Russians were in front of Kiev. That was... Uh, in April already, and it was based on a complete misunderstanding and misperception of the Ukrainian identity and unity and the capabilities to fight. Uh, probably the Russians thought everything but, but what happened in 2014 would be repeated, that uh, the Ukrainian army is not ready to fight and some parts even would uh, turn sides. Uh, on the other hand, in Kharkiv, we saw uh, incapability of the Russian forces in terms of leadership, also in terms of forces and strengths, of course, and we saw a lot of initiative on the Ukrainian side. Kherson is a different case. In Kherson, uh, is, uh, on, the, on the west bank of the uh, river, at Dnepr River, could not be uh, kept by the Russian side because of the logistics that could be easily uh, disrupted because there are only two or three very, uh, very narrow uh, bottlenecks uh, uh, over the uh, river. And that was a calculated retreat. So I would not be too uh, uh, ambitious on that and say this is an initiative of the uh, Ukrainian side. For the moment, I feel we did not we have not yet reached the strategic turning point of this war. The Russians have still a lot of reserves, maybe not high quality, but in masses, in tanks, in terms of artillery, in terms of personnel. The Ukrainian side will be more and more dependent on Western help because a lot of, uh, of own production capabilities has been destroyed and they need this uh, Western assistance. My question is, what are the uh, uh, risks on the Western side in political terms, but also in economical terms? Are we really prepared? Are we able to go to war production in the West, which would be needed if we want to sustain it? Natalia, in terms of the Russian will to keep on fighting, uh, is, it, is it still there, both in civil society? Well, uh, in political will, 
is there. I think Russia went, so to say, va bank when they started this war. And, you know, there's no way back. There's no way Putin's going to say, oh, sorry, we miscalculated now. Let's let us retreat. No, he he went all in. And even though the the goals of this um, operation, as he calls this, has been changing alongside when they saw like Kiev was not uh, possible to capture. Now we'll concentrate on Donbass, but they'll need to at least get some get something to to declare victory at home. So I think the the will is there. Whether there is a cap military capability, and uh, now we've seen that there have uh, been new recruits of well at least three. 300,000 um, new combatants. Uh, quality of them is a very questionable thing because those are people who maybe are not so motivated to go into army. Most of them haven't received a lot of training. We've heard a lot of stories about people going to combat just after, you know, two weeks of training, just after shooting a couple of times the gun with a gun and um, the willing to actually not fight and um, go away or like maybe even um, defect to the Ukrainian side is big there. But for instance, now um, I think there is a big um, also campaign, maybe not in the, in the media, but like in Telegram channels. There is a lot of this, you know, pro, pro war bloggers have gaining this momentum and uh, calling for more and more aggressive um, moves uh, now in Ukraine. So now has now I guess Kremlin has to balance between the reality on the battlefield and this, you know, need of this like small group of very vocant uh, war defenders or war activists mm. to like somehow balance these two sides. Is there any reason now, uh, Jessica, for the West to change their attack? Well, if anything, there's a reason for the West to increase their aid to Ukraine. But as Wolfgang pointed out, we're facing right now a real serious issue on production and supply. Of course, uh, there is still room for growth in our support of air defense. And in particular, we still have not seen delivery of MBTs, of main battle tanks, um, modern battle tanks being delivered to Ukraine. This would be vital in preparation for the spring offensive to give Ukrainian troops the protection in terms of armored personnel carriers as well as tracked tanks to be able to deal with the winter and spring mud conditions in the, in the oncoming offensive. We need to help Ukraine keep the pressure up on Russia, not allow Russia to regroup this winter and come into the spring fighting season stronger, but to do so would require a strong investment across all of NATO to increase our production so that our own strategic domestic reserves can be maintained in stock. Because, of course, China will be watching very closely to see if and when Western military resources are spread too thin, this opens a window for them to potentially put pressure on and attack Taiwan. So we are facing a difficult season. Uh, next year will bring a lot more difficult choices. But one thing is clear, Ukraine cannot be allowed to lose. Russia cannot be allowed to win. This is in all of our strategic interest across the free world. Uh, that brings me to my final question um, uh, for, for this uh, program. Uh, negotiations start when both sides uh, can't make any progress, really. That's an, a natural uh, point to start negotiations. Uh, let me start with you, Wolfgang, and briefly, uh, do you think we are close to that stage, maybe at that stage? At the moment, we are not close because, as I said, the turning point of this war has not been reached yet. Uh, on the other hand, if I look back to the 29th of March this year, uh, there were some quite uh, uh, good proposals, in my view, on the table, uh, saying that uh, Ukraine will not uh, join NATO. That is something Zelensky uh, put up there and, and communicated. The second, uh, the status of the Crimea Peninsula will be postponed by 15 years and negotiated in the meantime. And there will be a direct negotiation between the two presidents on the future status of the Donbass. Of course, everything under certain uh, security guarantees. Though this was, to my uh, mind, the best proposal so far on the table, the most realistic one. Uh, both sides have turned away. Uh, Putin has annexed territory, which of course uh, slams the door because uh, the Ukrainian side cannot negotiate additional territory. Uh, and we are not there yet in military terms. So Can there I is... just interrupt you there because yeah, please. time is running out. Uh, Natalia, uh, let's come to you first. How close are we to negotiations? Well, I think we're not actually very close. If there was a point when it was possible, or maybe, I don't know, I don't th think it was possible actually then, but we are so far into the fighting and I think Ukrainians have lost so much and they're, I think, less prepared to negotiate now 
uh, looking back as what has been how the war has been going on with all the you know crimes we've been discussing with all the new investigations and international net and everything how this war is going on i think there is less and less um agreement on the ukrainian side to actually negotiate with putin jessica what's your take you cannot negotiate with terrorists and Russia has acted as a terrorist state, even if they don't carry that legal distinction from the United States. If Putin is allowed to gain any net benefit from his invasion of Ukraine, then we all have lost. And this is the thing that must be not allowed to happen. This must not be allowed to happen. That's a good final statement. That's it for this edition of To The Point. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please let us know what you think in the comments below. Many thanks to my panel and all our viewers. Thank you very much. And see you next time on To The Point.